Amen. Well, we're back here for Bible study once again. Um, as we were just talking about, this will be our last Bible study here. We are moving into a, a bigger place, so we're excited about that. Um, last week we was we was entering into Romans chapter six, and and we were was talking about the the sinful nature and how that the sinful nature has power in an individual's life, and and we were really talking about how the mechanics were were placed into our life, the machinery that we need to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. And what Paul is doing here in Romans chapter 6, he's introducing this to the believer. He's he's answering questions that had been asked to him, he, and, and he's also coming against things that had been said about him. If we were to look back at Romans 3 and 8, where he said that he was being slandered erroneously by people saying that what he preached said that that because we have grace, that we can sin all we want. And, and he said, you know, that's that's just erroneous. That's false. That's not true. And like I've said before, I've had people say the same thing. And you will. When you preach true grace, this will happen. This will happen. And it will happen because either one of two things. First, some people just don't understand. And second, other people are just love law. They love religious law. And with religious law, they have a standard where they can compare themselves to one another. And people love to compare themselves one to another. It's why we see what we see out in the world today, um, people in their job places, you know, which there's nothing wrong with being successful, but people love to compare themselves. And the more power they get and the more money they get and the more people they have working under them, then they're better than the next man. And it's the same thing in religion. Religion loves law. Because if there's a standard that isn't Jesus, because they can never meet up to that standard. But if there's a standard that they feel like they can meet up to, they like to hold that standard up and compare themselves one to another. But really and truly, they're fools comparing themselves one to another. There's a standard that's set before us, and His name is Christ. His name is Jesus. That's the standard that we should ever seek to reach up to. That's the standard that we should ever seek to climb to. But the truth of the matter is that we can't get there on our own. We can't make it on our own. And if you've never realized that, then either you've never been born again or you're a religious fool and you've backslidden and you need to come back. But we can't get to that standard on our own. So what Paul would tell us here in Romans chapter 6 as he would start to open this great teaching up to us, as he would start to, to teach us about the mechanics, to teach us about the Holy Spirit, to teach us what took place in the life of the believer to allow him or her access into God's presence, access into the presence of the Holy Spirit, and also that gave the Holy Spirit access into his life. And how did the Holy Spirit work in that individual's life? What I want to do, I want to go back and start back at Romans chapter 5, the end of Romans chapter 5. And I want to read these few verses, and, and then we're, we're going to pray. And the Word says, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where the sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, we thank you for your mercy, Lord, and we thank you for your grace, Lord. Father, we ask that you would give us a better understanding of your grace, Lord God. That we would just understand what it is, Father, and, and and, and why you've sent it towards us, Lord God, and, and why you've placed it in our heart, and why you've given us access to this grace, Father. That you would give us a greater understanding of, of, of what it is, Father, and, and not only that, but how to access and walk in this grace, Lord. That we'd be able to walk on a continuous basis, Father, with your grace flowing in our lives and in our hearts, Lord God, to, to give us the ability, Lord God, to do the things, Father, that we can't do it and of ourselves, Lord God, because of the mere flesh that we are, Lord. We ask that you give us an understanding of, of your word, Lord, that you would anoint our hearts and our ears, Father God, that you would anoint our lips, my lips, Father, to speak your word, Lord God, and we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. So we read those two verses, and I know I've been going back there, and, and, and well, I was going to say, I, it's, I'm not going to go back there again, but I will. I'll be lying to you. I'll be standing up here lying on camera. I don't want to do that. So that as sin has reigned, even so my grace reigned through righteousness. And I just want to reiterate one more time what grace is. That, that grace is a divine influence upon your heart. 
and it's reflection in your life. It's, it's God working in you. It's God working in your heart and, and changing things and giving you the ability to live this Christian life. That's what grace is. It's the, the overcoming supernatural power of the Holy Spirit working in your heart. And, and the Word says that sin reigned, un, it reigned unto death in our lives. But even so, grace might reign through righteousness. It might reign in our hearts and in our lives through righteousness, through the righteousness that, that Christ died to give us, the righteous one, the one who is righteous, who was righteous, who shall ever be righteous, who so freely gives that righteousness to us, if we'll just submit to that. No greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Now, I want you to think about that because I was thinking about it today. And how Jesus said that there's no greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. Now, I want you to understand that the Word of God says that man is at enmity with God. Man is at war with God. He's not a friend of God. He's an enemy of God. But yet, Jesus would say that there's no greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. This man, Jesus... He laid down His very life's blood for those of us who were His enemies. Think about that. We were His enemies. Enemies of Him. He laid down His life for His enemies. So if there's no greater love than that a man would lay down his life for, for his friends, then what kind of love would lay down his life for his enemies? What kind of love is that? I don't even think that's a love we can comprehend. That's a love we can understand. But praise God. While we were yet sinners, that God commended His love towards us, that He sent His Son to die on Calvary's cross for us. Thank you, Lord. That He might freely give us a gift of righteousness. That through that righteousness, grace could reign in our hearts. And that it could give us the power and the ability to walk sin-free in this life. Oh, not sinless but that the power of sin would not control us. That's what grace can do in your life. That's what grace is about. That's why we need the grace of God. That's why we've got to preach the grace of God. That's why we've got to teach the grace of God. That's why we have to disciple people in the grace of God. Not the works of the church or the works of the law, but they need to be discipled in the grace of God so that they can understand what this grace is for. And what it can accomplish in their life. Because if they don't know, they'll go about trying to accomplish it on their own. And it can't be done. It can't be done. It, it, it can't be done. No one has ever done it. No one can ever do it. No one will ever do it. But one man. One man. The same one who died for his friends. But even more than that, died for his enemies. He died for his very enemies. So grace might reign through righteousness. This freak, well, how does this take place? What happens? How does this work? How does this take place in our lives? Paul would go on to tell us, what shall we then say then? Shall we continue in the sinful nature that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we who are dead to the sin live any longer therein? How can we do it? We're dead to it. Not grace so you can sin all you want. But grace because you're dead to sin. You're dead to it. So how can you live any longer therein? It's impossible. It's impossible for a born-again believer to live habitually in sin and not be convicted by the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. It's impossible. So what happens? This is where we get the this is where this stuff starts getting mixed up. People come in, they get saved, they give their heart to the Lord. And then the preacher starts thinking, what can I do to keep them from sinning? How can I help them to not sin? Preach the gospel. Teach God's grace. Let them have a better understanding of who He is and what He did and how it works in their life. Because if you'll do that, then the Holy Spirit will keep them. He'll keep them. He'll teach them, oh, there has to be a will. There has to be a choice. But if the Holy Spirit's living in them... If he's living in them and he's alive in them, mm -hmm. oh, they might find themselves in ruts. They might find themselves at a loss sometimes. But praise God, he'll keep them. I believe that with all my heart. He'll keep them. 
He'll keep them. He'll teach them. He'll train them up. And he'll use the preachers and the teachers, the evangelists, the pastors, to preach the gospel and to share it with them and to give them a better understanding of what the Word says about this thing called grace. Because this is what we're living in, a, a, a covenant of grace. A co we shouldn't be ashamed of grace. Preachers call it greasy grace. Oh, well, you're just talking about that sin all you want to, greasy grace, swagger gospel. No, no. No, I'm talking about the I don't want to sin gospel. That gives me the power not to sin. You see, because if that's what you think about God's grace, then you're living in sin and probably don't even know it. You probably don't even know that what you're doing is sin. Lord, help us. So, we don't know. We This is not that we shall continue in sin so grace can abound. No, we're dead to sin. God forbid. How shall we who are dead to the sinful nature, we're dead to the power of sin, how shall we who are dead to this power live any longer therein? If you're dead to it, how are you going to live in it? If you're dead to sin, how are you living in it continually? It's impossible. It's not possible for these things to coexist. Not when the grace of God is working in a believer's heart. Once again, I'm not saying they won't ever sin. But I'm saying, as long as they have their object of faith right, Jesus Christ, who He is, and what He did at Calvary's cross, the work of Calvary, and they're walking after that, after the Spirit in that manner, the Spirit of God will work in their heart. He'll work in their life, and that's what Paul's trying to tell them. No, this is, this is not what I'm saying. How shall you continue in it? How shall you live in it if you're dead to it? If you're dead to it, well, well, Paul, how does this take place? What do you mean I'm dead? I'm, I'm standing right here. How does this work? Well, don't you know? Don't you know? Have you not heard? Have you not been informed of what I'm about to tell you? Or have you been told and you don't believe it? Have you been told and you just don't believe it? A lot of people just don't believe that this is really the gospel. They just don't believe it. They've been told now. They've heard and they've heard, and they've heard, and they've heard. But down there, now they just, they, they're coming to the place to where they're rejecting it. And they just don't believe. So do you not know that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. This is where we stopped last week. We talked about this baptism. We talked about the fact that it wasn't water baptism. We talked about the fact that it was immersion into Christ. That it was being placed into Him at His actual death. That when we bowed our knee to the Spirit of God as He, as he came and He convicted up our hearts of sin. As the preacher preached the gospel or the singer sung the gospel or some way the gospel message had pricked our heart. And the Holy Spirit came in and revealed this to you, that you're a sinner. You're lost. Or you might not have knew exactly what a sinner was, but one thing had to happen. You had to know that you were lost. And God revealed it to you. You lost, son. And you need a Savior. And then he revealed something else to you, but I sent one. I sent the Savior for you. And his name is Jesus. And he died for you. He shed his life's blood for you. And when that became real in your heart, oh, not with just your lips. Not with just your lips because it's with your mouth that you confess, but it's with your heart that you believe. This is a heart thing. The word says it's with your heart that you believe unto salvation. Oh, you can confess it with your mouth. You see, us as Christians, a lot of times, we get confused with people when we hear them confess the name of Jesus. We hear them say the name of Jesus, but if their heart has never said it, if their heart has never believed unto salvation, then the truth of the matter is they could be just like the demons that the Bible talks about. That they believe and they tremble. They believe and they tremble. They tremble at the name of Jesus. I listened to Matt preach the other day and he talked about how these very forces, these very powers, these demon spirits, when Jesus would walk down the street, they would tremble in his presence. 
They would tremble. Oh, oh, son of David, what does thou have to do with us before thou time? They know. They know, but yet they're so deceived. They realize in his presence that they have no power. They realize that in his presence they can do nothing unless he allows them to. But yet they're so deceived. they so deceived that they kill, still keep going in the direction they're going. They still keep going in that direction. So a lot of people are like that today. They confess with their mouth, but they've never believed with their heart unto salvation. There has to be a heart transplant. Amen. There has to be a heart change. If there's not a heart change, then all you have is a lip confession. That's all you have. Because the Spirit of God, He will change your heart. Let me tell you something. If the Creator of all the universe, the one who hung the moon, the stars, who placed the sea between the shores of the land, the one who created the birds and the animals and the creepy crawlies and us, if he comes to live in your heart and you try to tell me that nothing took place, you didn't meet the same one I met. You didn't meet the same one I met. He's not a religion. He's a Savior. Amen. He's not a religion. He's a Savior. And when he comes in, he's going to make a change. Amen. He's going to make a change in your heart. He's going to do something different. So we're, we're buried with him by baptism into his death. We've been placed into his person at Calvary's cross. We've been crucified with him, Paul would say. This is a spiritual thing. It takes place in the spirit world. The moment that that happened, the spirit of God took you and he planted you in Christ. He placed you in the man Jesus. He didn't place you at the party where the wine was being changed. He didn't place you at Lazarus' tomb where Lazarus was being raised from the dead. He didn't place you in the sea where Jesus was walking at. No, he placed you in his death at Calvary's cross. I had a guy tell me one time that the cross was the greatest defeat ever. I said, no, sir, you don't understand the word of God. You don't understand because the cross is the greatest victory that mankind has ever seen. What took place at Calvary's cross is the greatest victory of any victory that's ever taken place. So we've been baptized. We've been planted. We've been immersed. We've been placed into Christ at his death at Calvary's cross. This is how this, is how this takes place. This is how the person is born again because he has to die. That person has to die. Amen. We have to die. We have to die to ourselves. And then we can be born again. So, Christian, you've been baptized into Christ. You've been placed into his death. Amen. That you should walk in newness of life. Not that you should walk in oldness of life. No, that's over with. But newness. You've got a new power source. We talked about that. There's a new king on the throne. Amen. Amen. Sin no longer reigns in your heart. But now the King of kings and the Lord of lords, He should reign in your heart. Because you should walk in newness of life. Amen. So now we're going we're gonna to go into verse 5 where I really wanted to get with our teaching tonight. And, and we're going start, to start moving forward to, from there. So far if we have been planted together in the likeness of of his death. Okay, if. I want you to understand what Paul's saying here. When he says, for if. If. He's not asking a question. He's making a statement. He's actually making a statement. And it really, truly could have been better translated. Since. Since we have been planted. Not if. No. Since this has happened. Since this has taken place. Since we've been planted into the likeness of his death. Now I want you to, to, to see something else. Right here where it says we have been planted together. This, this, it's, a, it's a combination of two Greek words that make up that we have been planted together. And the first Greek word is, and I might not be saying this right, but I'm not a Greek scholar, so mm -hmm. I don't think y'all are either. Genome. Genome. And, and that word means... It's a perfect tense verb. 
So it's speaking of a completed act with remaining results. So this planet together, this planet, it's an act that's taken place, it's completed, it's done, but yet it has abiding results. Results that remain in the life of a person. Okay? When I was in the world and I was living in the world, I got tattoos and I have abiding results. Remaining result that's going to be with me forever and ever and ever. And we see the same thing right here. I'm using that as an, an analogy. When we were planted together in this, this perfect tense relationship, this thing has results that abide in us and will abide in us and remain in us as long as we remain in the results. Okay, so the next word that makes that up, planted together, is the the word, oh, I don't even know how to say that, symphulo, symphulo, and it means to be growing along with, okay, to be growing along with or closely united, and it speaks of a living, vital union between two individuals. Now, Kenneth Weiss, the Greek scholar, he said that this area right here, this Greek word used for that can actually be used to speak of a set of twins. A set of twins that were born connected. And they were born connected and they shared the same blood source. And the same blood flowed from one body through another. Amen. You see the connection that I made? You see what's so good about that? Because we have been planted together in the likeness of his death. Now we're connected to his source. Amen. And we're set here to grow together with him. To grow together and be fed and be nourished from the life source that, that flows through his veins. Amen. We've been disconnected from the old life source. And we've been planted in a new life source. And now we can grow together in that life source. And we can be fed. We can be nourished from that life source. What does the word say about Christ? That he is the head. And each one of us, we're parts of the body that are nourished and we're ministered to from the head. And we see that right here taking place. So this is how this takes place. Don't you know? Don't you know that you're dead with Christ? That you've been placed? See, this is how it happens. This is, Christian, this is how it takes place. This is what takes place right here. Verses 6 and 7, we see the death of the believer. The death of the believer. Verses 8 and 9, we'll see the installation of the new machinery. And how that you overcome the sinful nature. Verses 6 and 7, we see how we become disconnected from the sin. Verses 8 and 9, we see that we how we have continuing power over the sin. So, amen. We're, we've been planted into Christ. And we think about that blood flow. We have the blood flow of the king. Amen. We got royal blood now. Amen. Praise God, we got royal blood. I might not look like royalty, but my big brother says I am. Amen. My father in heaven says, because you believe in my son, the one that's seated at my right hand, the one who has sat down until I make his enemies to be his footstool, because you put your faith and your trust in who he is and what he's done for you, no longer are you a sinful peasant. But now you're a royal part of the royal priesthood. A part of the royal family. And his very life's blood is flowing through your veins. The spirit is life. The spirit is life through righteousness. The spirit is life through righteousness. He is righteousness. So we have the life of the spirit flowing through our veins. Amen. That's good teaching. That's good Amen. teaching right there. The, the life, the spirit is flowing through our veins. We have access into this royal, this royal lineage. Because of what Christ did at Calvary. You know the word says that if the, the princes of this world would have known, they would not have crucified the king. If they would have known that they were fulfilling the plan of God, they would have never hung him on the tree. But praise God when they did, they were helping to open the door. They were helping to allow the spirit and the presence of God out from behind a veil a veil of sin that represented the flesh of Jesus. And they were helping to have that torn. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and your grace. So, so now we're planted in the likeness of his death. We've been planted in the likeness. And, and Strong says about, about likeness is that it 
amounts almost to equality or identity. Okay, that word identity, we, we know, we, we probably all heard of, we should have, if we haven't, we're fixing to hear of substitution and identification. The doctrine of substitution and identification. Jesus was our substitute at Calvary's cross. He died in my place. Amen. He was the substitute. He was that substitute. But now also the identification is that we're identified with him in his death. We've taken on his identity because of our union with him at Calvary's cross. When, when God looks down and he looks upon me, he no longer <coughs> sees me. But he sees his son. He sees his son because I'm in him. And he's in me. And we're both hidden in Christ, in God. Where the law has been fulfilled. And it no longer holds us down. We're no longer held bondage to sin anymore because we've died. We've died and we've, we've been made identical to his death at Calvary's cross. So, you know one thing about a dead man? He can't be held captive anymore. When the man who's been sitting on death row in Angola for 80 years goes up and he sits in that electric chair and he lays down and they stick those needles in his veins to, to take the life out of his body, once it's out, once it's gone, no longer is he captive. They don't go put him back in the cell. Oh, no, they go put him in the graveyard. He's been freed from that bondage. You and I have to understand that at one time we were in a prison of sin. We were in a prison of sin. And the world out there, they're in a prison of sin. They're in a prison of sin and they, they don't even know it. And I want you to understand, they don't have a choice. I know what the world tells us. Oh, well, people just make a choice to do this or do that. And the truth of the matter is, that's not true. That's not true. Because if you're not born again, you have no choice. If you're not born again, you have no choice because you're bound by sin. Oh, your prison might not be being a murderer or being a child molester or being something like that, but you're still bound by sin and you're still a prisoner. You're still a prisoner. But those people that are bound, they're bound by sin. That's why there's more doctors, more lawyers, more judges, more professionals, more technology, more pills, more drugs, more psychologists, more of anything. The smartest people that have ever lived, live today. And people are just as messed up today as they ever was. No different. No different. Because they can't fix them. Because they're in prison. They're in a prison called sin, but praise God. When you make your way to Calvary's cross and you put your trust in that man Jesus and you become crucified with him, the prison doors are open. The prison doors are open and you've been set free from the bondage of sin. This is something we got to know. We'd see Paul from verses 3 to 11. He talked about knowing something. He talk about no, don't you know, don't you know, reckon. Reckon is knowing, know this. You got to know something, believer. You got to know something, Christian. That you've been crucified with Christ. That you're dead to the power of sin. Therefore, you don't have to be controlled by the power of sin any longer. When sin knocks at your door, you don't have to say yes. When the thing that used to get you running off like a, like a, a horse after a carrot comes dangling in front of your face now, you don't have to run off. Because you don't have to answer in the same way you answered before because you're dead. You're dead. You're, your life is hid with Christ and God. You're crucified with Christ. You're crucified with Him. So that's our identity. We've been identified with Christ. No longer is it, is it us anymore that liveth, but it's Christ that lives in us. Amen. It's, it's Christ that lives in us. So... For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we've been identified with him in his death, we shall be also, it says we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. I want you to understand that that's not talking about the future resurrection. 
It's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about when our bodies are resurrected from the grave if we die. Oh, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. There's a song they used to sing that um, one of the ladies at Brother Swagger's church, boy, she used to sing that thing. I think it was Janet Paschal. And it was, we're going to come up out of this grave. Ain't no grave going to hold my body down. Ain't no grave. Hey, let me tell you something. If you know some loved ones that's, that they died and they, they, they went to that ground and they was born again, when the trumpet sounds, they're going to come up. Amen. There's going to be a, a, a resurrection. That's just all there is to it. But this is not talking about that resurrection. It says, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. How do we know it's not talking about that? Because the context is totally, it's a totally different context. This is talking about sanctification. This is talking about the believing, the believer who was a sinner, how that he died in Christ, how he's dead in Christ, and how that now he's walking in newness of life. Remember we just talked about newness of life? Well, the newness of life is the resurrection life. Resurrection power. Change me this hour. Resurrection power. We have access to resurrection power, the, the power of the Holy Spirit. When Jesus walked on, the, on this earth, he walked as a man. He walked as a man filled with the Holy Spirit, anointed by the Holy Spirit, walking under the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. But now that he lives, he's alive unto God as a Savior. Amen. With the fullness, the full, the, the, the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that he had, we have access. Now, we have access into this resurrection power. But this is the key. This is, this is the key. If, if, first of all, we've got to realize this is a fact that we died with him. That we should also be resurrected with him into newness of life. What does the, the word says about us? That we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. We're seated at the right hand of the Father. You know, I always I love when these when the word starts tying together. When the word starts tying together, and there's a certain verse, and I can't remember where it is right now, but the verse says that that in his presence is fullness of joy. And at his right hand are pleasures evermore. And I'm, I'm messing that up, but I'm on the right track. And I could never stop, and all I could ever think about that is that at the right hand of the Father is the Son. At the right hand of the Father is the Son. So in His presence is fullness of joy. And at His right hand is pleasures evermore. And the Word says about you and I that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I want you to understand that the place that you live, not in Galliano or Gold Meadow, up the bayou, down the bayou, or across the bayou, but the place as a Christian where you should dwell is at the right hand of the Father seated and resting in the work that was completed for you where that you're in his presence and there's fullness of joy and there's pleasures evermore in this man Christ Jesus I'm not talking about the pleasures of the world I'm talking about the spiritual richness that you can only get in the presence of God there's only one place where you can find yourself broken undone weeping about how sinful you are but yet feel so good about what's going on in your life. And it's in the presence of God. It's in His presence. And the only place to get in that presence is in this man, Christ Jesus. And I want you to understand that Christ, He paid a mighty price so that you and I could enter into the presence of God. Oh, we don't have to work for it. We don't have to earn it. We've got to accept it. We've got to believe it. And we've got to seek after it by continually looking to His Son who He is and what He's done for us to give us that access into this presence that His blood paid for. Amen. So, here's the key. You want resurrection power? You want to be in the likeness of His resurrection? Well, first got to be in the likeness of His death. Can't have resurrection without death. Amen. I want to point out something. The Word says... For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, actually, I didn't want to go far. I, I might have passed that, that scripture up, or I might have not have got back to it, got to it yet. Oh, okay, wait, here we go. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified. It don't say was. It said is. Knowing this, that our old man is 
crucified, that's present tense, is. Once again, another past action with abiding results. You want to live resurrected, Christian? Live crucified. You want to live with resurrection power? You've got to live in death. You've got to be a living sacrifice. And I always like the one that Brother Larson used. When the guy told him, yeah, I'm a living sacrifice. I, I, the Lord told me that I shouldn't put sugar in my tea. And you know what? Well, I hate tea without sugar. But I'm a living sacrifice, so I'm sacrificing. No, sir. It's not talking about suffering physically. No, no, that's, you might as well be a monk. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about being a living sacrifice, one who is alive from the dead. You're living continually in a state that you're dead. How do you do that? Easy. Live crucified. How do you do that? Easy. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Those that are justified shall live by faith. Well, how are you justified? Because you're dead. You can't be guilty if you're dead. That's over with. You're dead? Not guilty, sir. You're in the grave. By faith, you and I as Christians, we've been placed into Christ at His death, so we're dead with Him. We've been crucified with Him. His death is my death. His burial is my burial. His resurrection now becomes my resurrection. As long as I continue to believe in this day, as long as I continue to trust in this. Oh, there's got to be more than that. It's God's plan. It's God's plan, Cain. He don't want the fruit or vegetables from your garden. He wants the blood. It's got to be the blood. Oh, I know the blood's offensive. I know, I've been told. I just don't understand why it had to be blood. I've been told. I had people tell me that. I just don't understand why it has to be blood. It's so nasty. And I just want to say, Nicodemus, except that you're born again, you can't see what I'm trying to tell you about. You can't understand it. It don't make sense. But it's got to be the blood, believe me. So you want to live in resurrection power? Learn to live a crucified life. Learn to daily wake up and put your faith in who Jesus Christ is. The Son of Man. The Son of God. The perfect one. The Messiah. The Savior. The Christ. It wasn't His last name. It's what He is. He's Jesus the Christ. And what He did for you at Calvary. That he made his way there where he became the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The perfect, spotless one, without blemish, who would give mankind access into the presence of his Father, who sat on heaven and was pleased when his Son was crucified because of the access that was given to mankind to be back in his presence. But not only for mankind to be in his presence, but for him to be in the presence of man. It wasn't man that sought after God's presence. It was God that sought after man's presence. He sought us out. He sought us out. Let's never forget that. So, you want to live resurrected? You've got to live crucified. That's why Paul would say in Galatians 2.20 that I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Amen. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loves me and gave himself for me. I am crucified with Christ. You've got to know this. Not I was crucified, I am crucified. You've got to know this. You've got to believe this. You've got to learn to trust in this. It's not easy. It's not easy when you're struggling with sin. To know you're crucified. I know. I've been there. I've been there. Not too long ago. Finding old things coming back into my mind. Old feelings coming back into my heart. And saying, man, I know I'm supposed to be crucified. But it, it sure feels like I'm not. It sure feels like I'm, I'm alive and well. But I heard a message today. And Brother Larson was preaching about dead snakes. 
<clears throat> he was preaching about dead snakes, and I just want to throw this out there real quick because he, he talked about the fact that back in Montana, they would go around riding their bikes, and when they would see a snake, they would try to hit it with their bikes, and they would ride over its head, and they would crush his head, and then they would get out, and they would cut off the snake's head. They would cut his head off, but then they'd watch as the snake just laid there. And it would writhe around even more than what it was before. And it looked like it was alive. And I'm saying this to say this. That in Genesis chapter 3, and I believe it's verse 15, there was a prophecy that was the prophecy that was given. And it said that the, the God would place enmity between the, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Who's the seed of the serpent? Mankind. All of mankind that is lost is the seed of the serpent. Had somebody tell me that we're all children of God, I said, no, sir. We're not. This might offend you, but if you have not been born again, if Jesus Christ has not been made your Savior and your heart has been changed by you being born again, then you're not a child of God. You're a child of Satan. You're the seed of the serpent. And so was I. So the seed of the serpent, the word says, and then it talks about that the seed of woman would crush his head and he would bruise his heel. Speaking about the cross. This is what we're talking about right here. This is the fulfillment of the prophecy. This is what the prophecy would do. It would give us access. So yeah, you might still have a dead snake writhing around in you from time to time. As that old sin rolls around and, and tries to make its way back up. But if you'll continue to believe, Christian, if you'll continue to trust in who he is and what he did, That's right. one day that snake's going to stop wiggling. That's right. One day that snake's going to stop wiggling. I believe that. But don't worry. Don't wait too long because there's going to be another one right behind it. Yeah. <laughs> there's going to be another one right behind it to show itself. But we have access into grace. We're crucified with Christ. Let's learn to trust in that, to place our faith in that. And it's a process. It's a process of, see, it's one thing to know it, but it's another thing to know it. That's right. It's one thing to say it, but it's another thing for it to be living in you. That's right. and, and, and God has a plan. He, it's not just, okay, I hear something, I learn it, I know it, and now I can do it. No, it's I hear something. I start to put it into motion. Unfortunately, most of the time I fall down and bust my face open a million times. But I keep getting back up because I know that I'm not the righteous one. He is. And He gives me access to the righteous one, not because of what I've done, but because of what I believe. And if I'll continue to believe, That the seed of the woman has crushed the seed of the serpent, the crushed the head of the serpent at Calvary's cross, that he's going to give me power. He's going to give me this grace that I need. Amen? He's going to give it to me. So we see that knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve the sin. Now, we've already been going about 40-something minutes, so I, I really want to get into this, but it's okay. We've got plenty of time. We've, we've got, well, I don't know. Next week, we're not going to do this. But anyway, I want to talk about this just for real quick, and then we're going to close down. I'm trying to keep in that 45 minutes that my, uh, my friend keeps telling me about. <laughs> Amen. So here we go. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin. So what is the body? What is the body? It's the physical body. It's the physical body. Paul's talking about the physical body right here. The body of sin. Of sin. Sin right here is a possessive. It's possessive. So it possesses the body. It possesses the physical body and it controls the physical body. That's why I said a minute ago, a minute ago, that if you're not born again, you don't have a choice. You don't have a choice because your body is possessed by the power of the sinful nature. Whether you believe it or you don't believe it, whether you like it or you don't like it, I don't really care because I didn't write the book. 
He wrote the book. Your body is possessed by the power of sin. And if you're not born again, you don't have a choice on having victory over sin. And let me even say a little further. If you're a born again Christian and you don't know how to live for God, you don't have a choice either. You don't have a choice either. Because if you're not living by faith, then you're not living justified and you don't have access to grace. You have frustrated the grace of God. You've stepped aside. You've blocked it. And it's no longer flowing in your heart. And you don't have a choice. So you mean to tell me that Christians can live in a manner that they don't have a choice to, to, to not sin? That's right. Preachers, preachers would call me a blasphemer right now, but I can prove it. I can prove it in the next chapter, Romans chapter 7, when Paul said the things that I would do, I can't do. The things that I hate, I find myself doing. When I try to do good, evil's there with me. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? The proof's in the Word. If you're not born again, you have no choice. The power of sin controls your body. If you don't know what I'm teaching and preaching right now, not only in your head, but in your heart, then you haven't a choice. And you will in some shape, form, or fashion be controlled by sin. That's why the church is in the mess that it's in today because there's heretics standing beside the pulp, behind the pulpits and they're preaching heresies because they're controlled by sin because they don't know what I'm teaching and what I'm preaching. Not because it's me, but because it's God's Word. And it's the only way to have victory. The body is this body. And it's possessed by the power of sin. And it has to be killed. It has to be put to death. It has to be crucified. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That henceforth we should not serve the sinful nature any longer. We shouldn't serve sin. We don't have to serve sin any longer. Preacher, you don't have to be a heretic any longer. You don't have to preach heresies anymore. I know you didn't know, but open your eyes. Just see what the Word says. You don't have to be a heretic. It's not all about works. It's not all about how much you do. It's not all about how much you give. It's all about who He is and what He's done. And when you allow what He's done to work in you, you will do. I promise you'll do. But you know what you'll do? You'll do the work that He preordained for you to walk in. Too many of the church, they're doing their own works. They're doing their own works. But the Word of God says that for each and every individual, there are works, that good works, that God has preordained for us to walk in them. Not to create them, not to do them, not to thank them up and call them His work, but for us to walk in what He's preordained for us. That's in the Bible. It's Bible. It's Scripture. Can't tell you about exact verse right now, but Google it. You'll see it's Scripture. I can find it for you. But before we go any further, I don't really want to go past this point because I want to come back to the body of sin and talk about the body of sin and how that it has power. It has control over people. That's why there needs to be compassion. Jesus was a man of compassion. He was a man of mercy. He was brokenhearted for the sinner because he knew that they were possessed by sin. They were under the power of sin. I mean, my God is... That's why he died for his enemies. Because he knew that they were his enemies because they were possessed by sin. They were possessed by sin. The power of sin ruling and reigning in their hearts and in their life. But thank God the king has set us free. Amen. Amen. So we have a job. We have a ministry. The word of God says we have a ministry. And it's a ministry of reconciliation. Amen. Reconciling, reconciling man back to God, bringing man together with God. Well, how can I do that, preacher? Tell him about Jesus and how he died to set him free. Well, I sound like an idiot. Well, join the club. That's what we're going to sound like. I miss opportunities every day because I don't want to sound like an idiot. I'm not trying to stand up here and act like I go around preaching the gospel all day because I don't. I don't. It's a simple fact of the matter. But I'm believing and I'm praying that by God's grace, 
that by God's grace, he'll, he'll, he'll do a work in my heart that I'll continue to walk in more and more boldness. But even more than that, that I'll continue to walk in more and more love because we can have all these things and if we have not love, we have nothing. But folks, we need true love. We need the love of God, the love of Christ working in our hearts. We can't love people like we need to love them. We need to allow God to love them in us and through yes. us. That it would be by His Spirit and His power. But that's another message. Father, we thank You for Your Word tonight, Lord God. We thank You for Your mercy and Your grace. Lord, we thank You for Your Spirit and Your presence, Lord God, that's here to teach us, Lord God. We ask that You would allow the Comforter, Lord God, the Teacher, to teach us yes. and to make these words real in our heart, Father. Father, as we step forward into this new adventure, Lord God, as we place our foot forth, Lord God, and we, we go forth to preach and teach your word, Lord, we thank you for the provision of the building that you provided us with, Lord God, the finances. Lord, we lift up Ross, and we ask that, Father, you would have your way in his life, Lord God, that, Father, you would lead him and God, and not me, Lord God, not Matt or, or anyone else, Lord, but your spirit, Father, would lead in God this young man, that he would be a part of what you would have him to be. And, Father, that in any way we can, Lord God, that you would provide for us, that we can provide for him, Father. Lord, we ask that you would build this work, that you would use us, yes. train us in the ways that we should go, Father. Yes. Help us to make disciples of men, Father. Yes. And we'll give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name.